an uh, update of uh, where we are uh, in HIV cure research, focusing primarily on work that's been done uh, in people, uh, even though there's a huge amount of work that's been done in, in primates, much of it uh, very relevant to what we're doing. And I hope that I'll be setting the stage for um, uh, Jintanath's subsequent talk that will deal uh, more uh, directly with uh, issues of uh, cure in uh, female populations. Uh, these are my um, disclosures. So uh, why are we searching for a cure? Um, we know the incredible impact on uh, survival and uh, uh, preventing AIDS and many AIDS-related complications that antiretroviral therapy has had. Uh, so why uh, continue to uh, uh, to try uh, and find a cure for HIV? And I think there, there are many reasons for this. First of all, uh, the, as effective as antiretroviral therapy is, the fact that it needs to be given lifelong poses enormous challenges. There are there's the potential for side effects or long-term toxicities from uh, chronic administration over uh, years and decades. Uh, certainly the burden of lifelong adherence uh, is a challenge uh, for many. Uh, the costs of providing uh, ART over decades uh, become staggering, and there are serious concerns about the sustainability of uh, the uh, global uh, program in, uh, uh, in uh, antiretroviral therapy. In addition, we know that even though treatment uh, is very effective, there are still persisting effects of HIV uh, in patients who have uh, what appears to be full virologic suppression, and these include ongoing inappropriate immune activation and then uh, consequent end organ disease, uh, the cardiovascular system, the brain, and other uh, organs. And of course, if anybody ever stops their therapy and they have rebound, then there's the risk that they could once again transmit uh, HIV to their partners or to people with whom they uh, share needles. Uh, and most importantly for uh, uh, people uh, living with HIV uh, is the issue of the ongoing stigma of HIV infection and the, the reminder every day of their medication, uh, uh, of their status. So let me... Uh, provide some definitions just so that as I go through the talk, uh, people will, uh, will all be clear about uh, what I mean when uh, uh, talking about the reservoir or cure and, and, the, and the like. So by the reservoir, I mean cells that harbor a replication competent provirus that under the right circumstances can rekindle infection or uh, be responsible for transmission. So since, as I'll show you uh, in a few minutes, since we know that most of the cells that uh, have detectable HIV DNA actually have defective viruses, they really don't constitute a reservoir. And the fact that we count them uh, only makes things more confusing. But the reservoir, strictly speaking, is really those cells that could lead to continued infection. Latently infected cells, then by definition, are cells that have a replication competent provirus where the provirus is not being expressed at all. So there's no transcription, there are no proteins being made. And that's a key point because if there's no protein being made, then that cell travels incognito as far as the immune system is concerned and can't be targeted uh, for, inf uh, for elimination uh, uh, by um, cytotoxic mechanisms. Cure, then, would mean the elimination of all replication-competent uh, viruses and proviruses. But short of cure, we could uh, Im imagine having very long-term remissions, uh, some period of time, and nobody has been able to say how long this ought to be, uh, whether it's uh, uh, months, years, or, or decades, uh, during which uh, treatment would no longer be required uh, to maintain a viremia-free state without any risk of disease progression, uh, no uh, risk of non-AIDS events, and no risk of transmission. So uh, by way of background, there's been really amazing progress made in the last uh, five or seven years, understanding the mechanisms of latency, the anatomical and cellular nature of the reservoir, the genetic structure of the proviral DNA, and I'll show you a little bit of those data in a moment, uh, the contribution of clonal expansion of uh, CD4 cells to uh, maintenance of the reservoir, uh, and importantly, the development of therapeutic approaches in other disease areas, notably in uh, oncology and and in inflammatory diseases that might be repurposed towards HIV cure because of the effects these interventions have on the uh, human immune system. So to date, although we might hear uh, a new presentation uh, this week, but to date there's been only one documented case of HIV cure, and that's of course the Berlin patient, uh, Timothy Ray Brown, who had um, 
a, uh, 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 was HIV infected, had been on stable antiretroviral therapy, uh, uh, developed acute myelogenous leukemia for which he initially underwent induction chemotherapy during uh, that time. He, is there, I don't think there's, I don't have a point. Oh, no, look at that, okay. Uh, let me go back, figure out the different buttons here. Okay, so he, um, he, uh, on, on, during uh, induction chemotherapy, he became biremic, went back on heart, resuppressed, and then uh, underwent a stem cell transplant. And uh, 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 Mr. Brown was fortunate enough to have a hematologist, uh, Gero Hutter, who had the foresight to think, well, what if we could find somebody who is homozygous for the CCR5 deletion? CCR5 is, of course, a required co-receptor for most strains of HIV. Uh, the, the donor cells would be uh, genetically resistant to infection with HIV. And if we could cure this guy's leukemia using cells from a donor that's resistant to HIV, maybe we can cure his HIV at the same time. And that's exactly what happened. You can see here that uh, from the time of his... Uh, if I can make the thing appear again. Um, from the time of his transplant, there was no more uh, virus, and, that, and that, this is now a decade later, uh, and that's still the case. Now I'm stuck. No, I'm trying to make the slides advance now, and it's uh, given up on me. Uh, next slide. There we go, okay. Um, but just because you use the right kinds of cells doesn't mean you're always going to have success. And so uh, the uh, so-called Essen patient that was reported by Monique Nyhaus uh, from Amsterdam uh, uh, showed that because patients can have as minority variants viruses that use the other co-receptor, uh, you can do the same kind of transplant as was done in uh, Mr. Brown's case and then have virologic relapse. So here the green uh, represents viruses that use CCR5 and the red represents viruses that use the other co-receptor CXCR4. You can see when uh, they started treatment, he had only R5 virus, it's just a big green circle. And then uh, towards the uh, end uh, uh, of uh, this initial uh, section of the slide, there's a little bit of red inside that green uh, um, circle suggesting there was a, uh, another viral population that used the other receptor. They were less um, fit than the green ones, and so they didn't predominate. But after a stem cell transplant where the patient received uh, cells that lacked CCR5, the only virus that could now replicate was the CXCR4 using or X4 virus, and then that virus came to predominate and caused a very early relapse, and then the, unfortunately the patient eventually died of their uh, underlying leukemia. So uh, the, the approach that was taken in the Berlin patient and other approaches using uh, uh, attempting to block CCR5 are not guarantees of the success of, um, uh, of uh, the, this way of eliminating the, the reservoir. So we had an experience in Boston with uh, two patients, one of whom I'll show the data for, who didn't have leukemia but had lymphoma. And they had gone through several rounds of chemotherapy. They'd had uh, um, autologous stem cell transplants and then relapsed again. And now we're getting uh, allogeneic stem cell transplants. And these patients uh, didn't get uh, genetically modified cells or cells from a CCR5 deleted donor. They just got the normal uh, healthy donor cells. Um, uh, but they, what made these patients different from uh, patients uh, who've had this treatment in the past in the United States is that it had been a standard of care to stop antiretroviral therapy during the transplant because of the toxicities of the associated chemotherapy and drug-drug interactions with some of the medications that are given at the time of transplant. But because newer drugs were becoming available uh, and because of the close relationship uh, we have in our division uh, uh, in infectious disease with the oncologists, uh, at the Dana-Farber, uh, these patients continued on their antiretroviral therapy, and so they remained virologically suppressed throughout the transplant. And when we started following them, and this is work that Tim Henrich did when he was a, a fellow in the lab, um, uh, we were able to go back to stored samples and see that there uh, was detectable proviral DNA when they first underwent their transplant, but that after the transplant, we could no longer detect any proviral DNA. And then we did exhaustive uh, testing of these uh, 
patients with uh, leukapheresis to get very large numbers of cells, uh, uh, numerous PCRs. This patient even had a rectal biopsy, no evidence anywhere of uh, HIV. So we thought, uh, while he was still on antiretroviral therapy, so we said, okay, let's see what happens if we stop treatment. And for 200 days, nothing happened. And typically, of course, people rebound after two to four weeks. And he continued to be completely negative for uh, HIV in the plasma and HIV in his uh, uh, cells uh, here uh, out through 200 days. Day 200, uh, he had a visit. And then day 203 said, you know, I'm not feeling so well. I'm having fever, aches, and pains. I have a little bit of a headache. And we said, go back to your doctor, get a virus load test done. And of course, what happened is he had rebounded. Uh, and he rebounded uh, with the kinetics of primary infection because his new immune system from the donor, uh, the healthy donor, was completely HIV naive. So the very rapid rise in virus load to uh, uh, nearly uh, to, um, more than a million copies uh, uh, spread to the central nervous system with about uh, 270 copies in the spinal fluid. Fortunately, we could rapidly resuppress him and his, his uh, symptoms resolved. A very similar case um, in a different setting, uh, also uh, 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 reported by Tim Henrich, was of a patient uh, or a person being uh, seen in San Francisco as part of their PrEP program and having uh, 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 diagnostic testing done to, in order to initiate uh, PrEP. And he came in for um, this uh, visit where it turned out that although he was antibody negative, when they did the nucleic acid testing, they found that he had about 250 copies of virus. So very, very early HIV infection. So they immediately put him on a four-drug regimen with uh, uh, tenofovir, FTC, boosted darunavir, and raltegravir, got him suppressed, and then he uh, remained suppressed for uh, out beyond two years, during which time they were sampling every conceivable uh, uh, um, uh, 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 reasonably available uh, uh, part of uh, tissue, including uh, uh, extensive biopsies in the gastrointestinal tract, the spinal fluid sampling, uh, lymph node biopsy, and couldn't find evidence of HIV anywhere. So after all of that negative testing, they again stopped treatment to see what, did he really still have HIV or not? And exactly like the second pa patient B from Boston, went 200 days and then relapsed. And, and because he had never developed an HIV-specific immune response b because he got such early therapy, his relapse, again, looks very much like primary HIV infection. So two uh, very similar experiences. And then, of course, there's the Mississippi baby that uh, um, uh, Deb Prasad has uh, reported where uh, the baby got treated very early, uh, was presumed to have been infected very late in utero, uh, was uh, put on treatment, but then um, uh, the mother stopped coming in with the baby for follow-up and went for several years without any antiretroviral therapy, and when uh, picked up again in clinic was uh, HIV negative, but as you know, eventually did a rebound here uh, four years after um, uh, being infected. So it's possible to have very long periods of remission, uh, and we also learned that when we can't measure virus it, or detect it, it doesn't mean that the virus is really gone. And only these long periods of follow-up can tell us whether virus has truly been eradicated or not. And then the uh, one uh, ongoing story now is the the uh, share a child uh, who uh, had early therapy, not immediately postnatally, but in early infancy, and then uh, remains uh, now at uh, uh, nine or 10 years uh, without evidence of HIV infection, uh, having gone for uh, 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 most of that period uh, without, any antiretroviral, without any antiretroviral therapy. So what have we learned from these experiences? Well, first, it's possible to reduce substantially the reservoir of HIV by a variety of approaches, whether it's by stem cell transplantation, by a very early antiretroviral therapy. And in the setting of an allo transplant, when it's an unrelated donor, uh, or an un, uh, not an identical donor, uh, this reduction is probably mediated immunologically. It's the graft versus host reaction that's killing these cells, not because they have HIV, but because they're foreign to the immune system, and it's killing all of the cells indiscriminately. Uh, and more or less as a side effect of that, getting rid of the HIV-infected, uh, uh, latently infected cells. The reduction in the reservoir then prolongs the time to re viral rebound, which tells us another critical point, that if we're going to have sustained remissions, we're going to have to reduce the size of the reservoir. I haven't shown you the data, but in, in our uh, 
in the Boston patients and then in the patient that Tim followed in San Francisco, there was no detectable HIV-specific immunity because the, uh, in the case of the transplant patients, the cells were from an HIV-uninfected donor. And in the case of the acutely infected person, no opportunity for the immune system to develop. So in the absence of any HIV-specific immunity, you can maintain a virus-free period for 200 days so long as the reservoir is sufficiently small. So that's another uh, important point, and I'll come back to that uh, uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes. But uh, as I've mentioned, virus nevertheless persists in parts of the body that are inaccessible to uh, clinical sampling, and reactivation of those rare cells wherever they may uh, reside is sufficient to rekindle infection and, and to cause a virologic relapse. And then we also know from the experience with the Essen patient that minority X4 variants can lead to relapse in the context of a, a homozygous uh, CCR5 deletion. So one of the big challenges we have is in pr uh, properly measuring the reservoir because if we just try to do a straightforward proviral DNA PCR uh, by assays that have been in place for, for many, many years and assays that are similar to what's used to make the diagnosis of HIV infection uh, uh, in um, uh, neonates uh, soon after birth, uh, we're measuring a lot of viruses that are actually dead viruses. And that's uh, represented in this uh, slide from uh, Yachi Ho and Bob Silicano's group as the, the large outer um, uh, uh, shell here, this big, uh, the large blue shell. Uh, the number of uh, cells that actually carry virus that can be reactivated is a tiny fraction of that shown as the yellow shells inside and the proportion may vary from patient to patient but it's always a minority of the total and then if you do sequencing to see well how many viruses appear to be intact but might not have been reactivated in that round of stimulation you get this uh, uh, red or purple uh, shell that's uh, of intermediate size and, and that uh, poses the real challenge of trying to discern which of these is the real reservoir. So um, uh, Radwa Sharaf, who's a, a graduate student in our lab, uh, working principally with John Lee, has uh, looked at the, uh, has characterized the, these uh, pro proviral uh, uh, sequences in uh, people who spontaneously control HIV after stopping therapy, so-called post-treatment controllers, and uh, people who fail to control, and shown that in both cases, very much like uh, uh, Yachi and, uh, and Bob's group have shown in, uh, in uh, chronically infected uh, patients on therapy, that uh, the vast majority of the proviruses are defective, and even the ones that are full length, uh, uh, most of them have uh, uh, many mutations and are, uh, are hypermutated, and only a small minority are uh, actually intact. And when you compare the um, proportions, uh, sorry, uh, can you advance the slide? There we go. When you pr compare uh, the composition of the reservoir between the co post-treatment controllers and the non-controllers, you can see the non-controllers have a, a reservoir that's about seven times larger on average than the post-treatment controllers, but the relative proportions of intact and defective viruses are, are the same in the two groups. That's not, uh, okay, here we go. Now, the other point about the clonality uh, is wh why would cells be expanding uh, if, uh, and come to be clonally expanded if they're carrying HIV? Well, one idea is that these are cells that are responding to antigens that are uh, highly uh, prevalent uh, uh, or common among people with HIV infection, such as uh, EBV and CMV. And so in this slide here, these are uh, data again from uh, another uh, um, uh, cancer group uh, of uh, patients of, uh, sorry, another group of patients with HIV infection and cancer that Tim Henrich uh, uh, had studied uh, uh, in Boston. and. It, for each participant here, there's a pair of graphs. And the first graph shows you, the one on the left shows you what proportion of cells were responding to EBV or CMV. And you can see the dark bar is the, uh, the shows what's uh, the response of cells. So only a minority of the cells are actually responding to EBV in an in vitro antigen stimulation assay. If we then say of all those cells that, if we sort the cells that had a positive response to the viral antigen and ask what proportion of these cells are HIV, uh, carry HIV provirus, you can see in each case now on the right hand part of the 
of the graph uh, of each pair that the, uh, there are many more HIV positive cells among the responder cells than the unresponsive cells. What that means is that these cells are being uh, driven to expand in response to antigens like EBV and CMV, like HIV, and that is allowing the viral reservoir to uh, to increase in size. Uh, and then, on the uh, while receiving antiretroviral therapy, there's no uh, uh, loss of these cells because uh, the viruses aren't actually being uh, able to um, uh, infect new cells and, and cause uh, cell death. Now. Um, one really the one important monkey study that I'll show you was uh, data that uh, Afa Makoye from the uh, University of Oregon presented in uh, November at uh, the um, Strategies for a Cure meeting, uh, I'm sorry, in October, at the Strategies for a Cure meeting at NIH that really helps tie this together in terms of the difference between immune control of the reservoir and uh, the contribution of the absolute size of the reservoir. And so what, what AFAM did was to take uh, uh, macaques who were infected with S SIV, start them on therapy, and when they were fully suppressed, depleted their CD8 cells, the cells that are, are the cytotoxic T lymphocytes, and then stopped the antiretroviral therapy. And what was uh, surprising is that, uh, first of all, the time to uh, rebound is really no different from whether you depleted the CD8s or, or not. So CD8s were not responsible for maintaining a state of latency. Uh, we know that from the Boston patient and the San Francisco patient because in the absence of any CD8s, they still had latent infection uh, without viremia. Uh, and the reactivation rates were not any different. However, if you look at what was the set point uh, in, and compare the set point of the animals who had their T cells, CD8s depleted and those who didn't, the depleted group shown in the top line, the aqua color here, um, had two log higher set points compared to those who had CD8s. So th this uh, leads to, um, an, sorry, an important conclusion that the immune system may be limiting the extent of rebound, but it doesn't necessarily prevent rebound per se. Uh, but what is clearly related to the, uh, the time to rebound is the size of the reservoir. And that leads to uh, this model that Allison Hill uh, put together based on, in part on the, the data from the Boston patients and from, uh, from others, that you can estimate what the probability or, of relapse is and the time to relapse based on the magnitude of the reduction in the reservoir. So if you get about a three log reduction in the reservoir, as we did in our patients uh, in Boston, you can have about a one year long uh, period of, uh, of uh, relapse free survival after which you'll have rebound. To be able to get a 10 or 30 year uh, survival, you'd have to have a four log reduction. And to be able to say somebody's cured, you'd have to have a five or six log reduction. And we can't measure much more than a three log reduction. And so that creates a, a real uh, conundrum. So the implications of, these, uh, uh, of this work is that the reservoir size is a determining factor in the time to viral rebound, that CD8 T cells do not appear to alter the timing or kinetics of rebound, but limit the extent of rebound. Approaches aimed solely at enhancing uh, CD8 uh, T cell responses are unlikely to prevent rebound then, in my view. Uh, but an, an enhanced immune response could still be an important factor for containing rebound in the setting of a reduced reservoir. <coughs> so what does it mean then going forward in terms of different approaches to cure? I think it's generally accepted that a multi-pronged uh, or combination approach is going to be required to both reactivate the latently infected cells so that they become recognizable by the immune system, and then to eliminate and destroy those cells by reactivating the immune system itself and making it more effective at uh, uh, recognizing and uh, eliminating uh, the cells that are now expressing HIV antigens. And various approaches have been uh, proposed, including the use of uh, cell-based therapies through uh, um, uh, gene-edited cells uh, of either uh, stem cells or mature peripheral T cells, uh, various approaches to latency reversal, uh, immune-based interventions, including uh, checkpoint inhibitors, therapeutic vaccines, uh, 
uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies or bifunctional antibodies, and of course, a very early uh, intervention uh, by uh, treating acute infection or a very early uh, treatment of uh, HIV-infected neonates. Now, the AIDS Clinical Trials Group is, has been uh, conducting a large number of studies, uh, one of which, uh, ACDG 5337, is going to be presented on Thursday by uh, Tim Henrich again, uh, who seems to be uh, doing quite a lot uh, in the field here. Um, there are uh, five or six studies that are either ongoing or about to uh, be begin, and I'll uh, highlight, I'm not going to talk about it because Jintanat may say more, but I'll just mention that one of those studies, 5366, uh, which Eileen Scully is leading, is the first study to be done exclusively in HIV-infected women. It's a reservoir study using tamoxifen uh, and varinostat to see whether the antiestrogen compound tamoxifen uh, potentiates the uh, uh, latency re reversal of varinostat based on uh, data that Jonathan Karn had generated uh, in the laboratory. So what about cell-based therapies? Well, we've learned that these are generally safe. Uh, the genetically modified cells usually persist for months and years. Uh, those cells, are, are the uh, resistant cells can be enriched in the population if you stop therapy, and they then have a selective advantage. But it's hard to achieve consistently high proportions of knockouts. Uh, maybe 60 or 70 percent of the cells will carry a knockout, and that's only homozygous, uh, heterozygous. To get both copies knocked out is much harder. And it's unclear how these genetically modified cells actually go about mopping up the reservoir. They may be resistant to infection themselves, but they're not going to touch the reservoir. So that's, that's a challenge. So we're still left uh, asking whether the Berlin patient uh, outcome can be replicated, uh, particularly using genetically engineered cells, and whether it's sufficient to introduce these modified cells or it has to be coupled to an approach that would actually attack the reservoir directly. Uh, and then the cautionary note from the Essen patient again of, of what role pre-existing X4 variants might have in impeding uh, approaches that rely on uh, knocking out CCR5. Well, what about latency reactivation? What we've learned so far is that for the drugs we have available at current uh, doses, the, the effects have been incredibly modest. And that if maximum stimulation in the laboratory only reactivates a part of the reservoir on any given day, we're going to need to use repeated cycles of reactivation in order to get the majority of the reservoir reactivated in, uh, in people. And it's highly unlikely that reactivation alone will suffice to deplete uh, the reservoir. So where, where are we going with this? Well, we need to see whether there are safer, more effective approaches to latency reversal. Uh, how many cycles uh, would be necessary? Uh, what if we can't induce some cells? If, if, if cell doesn't want to wake up, maybe we're just better leaving it, off, uh, leaving it asleep instead of trying to stimulate it. But we can't be sure it won't wake up sometime in the future, which is, is the real challenge. And then if we are going to combine latency reversing agents with immune-based uh, uh, therapies, what's the timing and the schedule? Do you vaccinate first and then give a reversing agent? Do you uh, use the latency reversing agent and then um, give the broadly neutralizing antibody? Uh, probably each combination is going to require different scheduling, and sorting that out is going to require a large number of pilot studies to get the details correct. Well, what about uh, cytokines, uh, checkpoint inhibitors, and other uh, antibody-based approaches? Uh, I'll only uh, comment about the, uh, the uh, anti-alpha-4 beta-7 uh, story because uh, the, there had been a lot of hype about that when it first came out, and then uh, following the data that were presented this summer, uh, a fair bit of uh, disappointment. So there was a study done in macaques that showed that if you gave uh, the, an antibody against this um, um, uh, adhesin molecule, alpha-4 beta-7, which is uh, highly expressed on cells at home to the gut, that um, you could actually a uh, stop antiretroviral therapy and you would see uh, uh, sustained control of the virus. Uh, so here the red is the control animals that got immunoglobulin and the blue are the monkeys that got, got alpha-4 beta-7. And the reason this is so exciting is that vetalizumab, which is a, an approved drug for the treatment of uh, inflammatory bowel disease, is an alpha-4 beta-7 antibody and is very well tolerated in people. So one could imagine moving directly into human trials to, to see if this result could be replicated. Problem is, 
when the experiment was done a second time in a different group of monkeys with a different kind of SIV, the exact uh, uh, opposite result was obtained in that there was no difference whatsoever um, that the um, uh, animals that got the antibody and that got control immune globulin had precisely the same level of virologic rebound and none of them controlled. It's not surprising then that in the human trial that was done in chronically infected, a mix of chronically infected and acutely infected people at the time they started therapy, but all on long-term antiretroviral therapy, that uh, after having, receiving multiple infusions of vetalizumab when treatment was interrupted, whoops, that's, uh, that there was absolutely, uh, that the, um, uh, everybody rebounded and the kinetics of rebound were the same as had been seen in previous trials. There was no control arm, but they used historical control. So no impact, and now there's little enthusiasm of moving forward with this uh, intervention. Sorry, it keeps hanging up here. Oops, okay. So what have we learned from these experiments? So there are encouraging data from uh, non-human primate studies, limited human trials to date. The toxicity profile of the checkpoint inhibitors continues to evolve in the oncology setting, and the regulatory agencies have shown appropriate caution in how we approach these trials uh, in healthy HIV-infected persons, and the risk-benefit ratio remains to be defined. We are about to embark on a, s a study in the ACDG of simiplumab, a... Um, another one of the PD-1 uh, antibodies, uh, and we do that uh, uh, with a great deal of circumspection and caution because uh, of concerns of the potential uh, toxicities of, of the therapy, even though we're only giving two doses uh, uh, in the study. So uh, where are we going with these approaches? Well, there's appropriate continued interest in exploring the role of these therapies in pilot studies. Uh, they are going to have to be explored in combination with other modalities. Uh, and uh, using combinations can be a double-edged sword. We might increase uh, potential for uh, effectiveness, uh, uh, but we may also be increasing the chances for uh, toxicity. And it's going to be important to confirm in human studies uh, uh, promising results from the non-human primate model. Can you advance? I'll say just a brief word about therapeutic vaccines, if, you can, if I can have the next slide. Uh, is, uh, whoops. So it either doesn't want to go or goes too, too quickly. So, uh, so neither, n nearly all the candidate vaccines that have been tested have shown good immunogenicity in early phase studies. And in, there have been encouraging results in the, in the monkey studies. But the effects in human trials uh, have been really very, very modest. And there's no consensus on correlates of vaccine efficacy and no systematic approach for building on the results of one trial to move to the next trial so that there's some logical uh, uh, progression and, and uh, development campaign. So we really badly need to define the endpoints for clinical trials to have correlates of activity, have a sustained focus on promising candidates. Usually what happens by the time the study's done, uh, the company has moved on, there's no more vaccine. Uh, you start with the next vaccine, which has got a completely different basis of, of action uh, in terms of the uh, immune responses it generates. And, and we can't ever say, OK, we, what we're really trying to do is get this response stronger, broader, uh, more, um, uh, uh, more frequently. Uh, and, and we are basically not much further on now than we were uh, 20 years ago when we first started doing these kinds of, uh, of uh, studies. Uh, we need to have long-term objectives and a clear go, no-go criteria. Uh, next. And then uh, to uh, uh, start wrapping up here, uh, we need to rethink how we're doing treatment interruptions. Uh, uh, treatment interruptions we know are safe if done with appropriate monitoring. There are hypothetical risks, uh, such as primary infection syndrome, the risk of transmission, and there's a report about a transmission during an ATI that uh, uh, is uh, circulating. Um, time to rebound and set point give very different endpoints. And as you saw from the data from Afamakoe, the depending on the intervention, we may need to use one endpoint or the other endpoint to understand the uh, impact of the intervention. Um, whether we should be doing treatment interruptions in people who are getting the control is, an, is another issue. And then we need to have agreement on criteria for uh, restarting antiretroviral therapy. Uh, next, whoops. Okay, here, yeah. 
So uh, jo John Lee and uh, Zach Strongen in the group uh, uh, pr uh, published data that showed that treatment interruption uh, really doesn't, at least for a limited period of time, doesn't really cause a sustained increase in the size of the reservoir. You can see here uh, there was real, the uh, there's no difference here compared to pre-ATI, and the the ratio was about one. Um, so that's reassuring, and there have been several other reports that uh, have come to the same conclusion. Next. So let me end then by um, posing some uh, unanswered questions uh, that the field has to tackle with. What's the, minimally, uh, the minimum clinically acceptable duration of a drug-free remission? If we succeed in achieving remission, are we talking about a one-year remission, a five-year remission, a 10-year remission? How long does it have to be to make it worthwhile to go through what's likely to be an arduous uh, six or nine month uh, treatment period? Is uh, remission or cure sufficient to return the pro-inflammatory state back to baseline so that there is no continued increase of cardiovascular disease and neurologic disease and the like? Uh, how can we determine the effect of uh, remission or cure on the, on the risks of transmission? Uh, we pretty much know that U equals U, but if, what if you rebound? And uh, particularly if you're thinking about women who uh, might become pregnant, would you dare not to give antiretroviral therapy to somebody who was in remission uh, because they were uh, undetectable? And the most important question would really be, at what point can we equate sustained remission to cure? When do we reach that asymptote that we can now say that somebody is, is in fact actually cured? I think Timothy Ray Brown is probably cured, but what he really has is a 10-year-long uh, sustained remission, and I don't know that we can say anything more definitively than that. So let me stop there, thank a large number of people who uh, contributed data uh, that I showed you, and uh, if there's time, I'm happy to answer a couple of questions. We do have time for questions, so if there are any questions, please go ahead. In the meanwhile, while the question is being raised, I want to do a little bit more elaborate on the treatment interruptions. We know in the pediatric studies specifically that it seemed to have worked, and you touched on it. And uh, going forward, um, do you see space? Because I feel in the conferences there is such a division between adult world and mm -hmm. pediatric. We are much more acceptant of treatment interruption than adult world. Uh, is there any view in an adult end of the conundrum uh, on the treatment interruption strategy for clinical use, for example? Right. So, I, so in terms of clini for clinical management, I, I don't think there's really any enthusiasm for um, st stopping therapy and allowing people to have virologic rebound uh, a as a means of um, sparing therapy. You know, certainly the SMART study uh, uh, put uh, the nail in in, uh, in that coffin, and uh, and I think the the concerns are uh, different concerns in adults than in, in children because the two major concerns in adults would be one that the uh, uh, associated increase in inflammation has uh, consequences in terms of uh, end organ disease, and and that's why uh, cardiovascular endpoints were so prominent and smart. And then secondly, the transmission risk, uh, uh, which uh, at least in young children is not the issue in adolescence; it becomes an issue. And you know, from my perspective, the issues in uh, in children with ATIs, particularly if you're talking about uh, uh, infants who were started on therapy immediately postnatally, um, they're very much like the acute infection patients, where they don't have a well-developed immune response uh, to the virus, and so the risks if they relapse may be greater. Uh, and uh, I think the the goal in that situation is to try and think of other interventions that can be added to treatment before you do the interruption to try and ameliorate the, the consequences of rebound. Thank you very much. Sorry, question number two, please. Oh, thank you so much for this great talk. So my question really relates to women who are breastfeeding. Uh, there was a case analysis uh, from three women um, in Canada where they measured uh, the provirus in breast milk, and these were women who were virally suppressed while breastfeeding. And one out of three had a proviral DNA. I, I believe it was in a monocyte. Mm -hmm. And uh, the clinical significance of that is um, not very clear. But for women who are breastfeeding, where there are repeated opportunity to transmit, um, even if the woman is suppressed, to transmit proviral DNA, I just wanted to see if you could comment on the risk to increase the HIV reservoir among, you know, repeated uh, breastfeeding um, uh, 
uh, exposures and also whether or not we should be concerned about the pro-virus. You mentioned that a lot of them are not, or not gonna activate, um, but whether or not we should follow those kids long-term and see if there's a risk for reactivation. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So I think um, there, there is a appropriate concern that even if there's not free virus, that uh, um, cells that harbor infectious virus that are ingested could potentially reactivate and, and be a cause for infection. We know from work that Max Essex and his colleagues have done that uh, there is uh, that the um, the size of the reservoir uh, or the, the, um, the level of Proviral DNA in milk is a correlate of risk of transmission in women not receiving antiretroviral therapy. But we also know that uh, antiretroviral therapy in breastfeeding women contributes significantly to a reduced risk of, of transmission. And because the vast majority of those cells harbor defective viruses, the, the vast majority of them are not going to be capable uh, of transmitting. So while I think it is a hypothetical risk, uh, in reality, the risk is, is really tiny. And I think um, uh, it is uh, appropriate to monitor the children for a limited time, but it's not like these kids are going to uh, show evidence of infection you know, years later if they uh, haven't shown in infection during the time that they are, are breastfeeding. There are other people in the room here who are much more expert uh, on that uh, topic than I am. So, um, other questions? Um, here's one. Sure. Here's one question, please. Sharon? <clears throat> My concern is, is really one of the things that you've raised is, is if we think this residual inflammation and all of that are causing bad outcomes in terms of heart disease and whatever, uh, if we cure HIV and we don't get rid of that, may we actually have a worse situation uh, than people taking a single tablet regimen once a day? I, I think it's possible. Uh, you know, I, I think we have to be very realistic and not uh, kid ourselves about uh, what it is that we are likely to achieve and what may not be achievable uh, if we can, in fact, uh, induce sustained remission or, or even uh, have cure. Uh, and, you know, there are lots of analogies that you can consider, but uh, for example, the patient cured of Hodgkin's disease is not returned to a completely healthy state. They are somebody who had Hodgkin's disease and suffered all of the um, a, a assault of uh, combination chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and they're never going to restore be restored to complete normal health. Uh, and uh, I think especially in discussions with potential participants and with members of the community, uh, realizing what are uh, appropriate and realistic goals and expectations of cure uh, uh, research and a potential cure and what um, are more aspirational goals that may not be achievable is a, is a critically important issue in ensuring that this work continues to be done uh, ethically. Yeah, no more questions, Daniel. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure.